those things, we would put that into what I'm going to call awareness. That was one of the key areas that you talked about, awareness. So what you're saying is, with that, you would be more aware of how your diversity and ethnicity and whatever contributes to various kinds of things. Well, that's sort of a segue into my presentation. My presentation is really around emotional intelligence. And sometimes I like to just kind of reverse the, the terms just so that it sometimes makes more sense, and that is being intelligent about emotions. Because when you say emotional intelligence, eh, that kind of gets foggy and doesn't make any more sense. But when you say being intelligent about your emotions, now I think we kind of grasp it a little bit better. But before we get into that, there's a few things that uh, I want to do. And I, I'm going to throw some emotional expressions on the screen here. And wherever you are, wherever you're sitting, I just want you to write down, just write down what you think that expression is. What you think that she's communicating and what you think that expression is. So for instance, if uh, you're looking at that and she looks happy, you just write down happy. If you think she looks uh, angry, you just write down angry. You think she looks um, disgusted? Right now, disgusted. What do you think that emotion that she's projecting out there says? Okay. Okay. Here's another one. <laughs> Let's jot that one down. What do you think uh, she's communicating? In other words, if you saw that, if that was someone looking at you or standing nearby you, or you were approaching them and they had that expression, what would you say was going on with it? Here's a third one. Okay, a fourth. Fifth. And one more. That's the sixth one. Happy. Happy, excited, okay. For that one I had happy, okay. What about the second one? Frustrated. This one. Anger. Frustrated. Frustrated, anger, what else? Upset. Upset, okay. For that one I had anger. Okay. What about the third one over? Disgusted. Disgusted. What was that? Mad. Mad? Um, she looks like she's going a gangster face to me. Okay, a gangster face, and a gangster face is? Hardcore. Yeah, like, she's like, 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 we didn't know that gangsters were disgusting, did we? Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, what about the bottom left? Surprise. Surprise. Shock. Surprise. Shock. I had surprise for that one. I thought it was really interesting because Dr. Thomas earlier was talking about the uh, emotions and emoticons and things like that. Sometimes, you know. Nowadays, because we have all this high-tech equipment and cell phones and things like that, and we can add emoticons. Yeah, at one time there was only one emoticon out there. Happy Remember face. what that was? Happy, Happy face. Because it's easiest. Now, how many emoticons have you seen? Thousands. 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 Yeah. Because technology is moving fairly quickly, and we're learning that we can have a symbol and mean the same thing as a lot of words. So they say a picture is worth what? A thousand words. A thousand words, okay. And we took this uh, <coughs> motor car. So now if we don't even need the motor car, if I was on my cellular device or something, I put OMG down there, what would you expect? Oh, you're shocked. Yeah, in shock, surprise. Or mad. So now you don't even need to have the facial expression in terms of sharing that emotion with someone, if you just put OMG and someone saw that on your cell phone or you texted to someone, 
they would assume that you were what? Uh, surprised or shocked by something. So you just communicated the emotion to that other person, okay? Without a facial expression, without it being face to face, but you found a way to do it. Okay? When we talk about emotional intelligence, we talk about being intelligent about our emotions. How do we do that in so many ways? Now we just kind of play around with these. What do we have for this one? Panic. 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 Fear. Okay. Now we had fear. And what about the last one? Sad. Sad. Upset. Sad. Upset. Upset. Emotion. So, you think about the seven dwarfs or something like that, sleepy or somebody? Oh, okay. Yeah, for that one I had sad. Okay. But well, why did I do this? Well, really because where did you learn to discern what these emotions or the expressions? Throughout everyday life. Throughout life? High school. High school. Yeah. You know they say that, you know, infants, infants, when they're about four or five months old, they can discern at least two major emotions, distress and okay. happiness. He said if you pick up a baby, if you're holding a baby in your hand, in your arms, and you just look at the baby and you smile, and you continue to smile, what will the baby usually do? Smile. Smile back. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? because it recognizes pleasure. And pleasure is where that smile is coming from. If you just kind of stare at the baby, wipe all the emotions off your face, and I know you've done this, I hear you, what will the baby usually do? Cry. Start to cry. Start to cry. Isn't that something? Because it's under distress. It's under distress because it, you cannot recognize what's going on. You cannot recognize that emotion that you're expressing. So we learn emotions at a very, 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 very early age. One of the things that happened though is our parents and our schools and even the jobs and a lot of things tell us we need to take those emotions and put them somewhere. That emotions aren't allowed in here. One of the things that we're finding in the workplace nowadays in particular, they want emotions. They want emotions. And they want you to be intelligent with those emotions. They don't just want the emotions that's not under control. They want them to be intelligent. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I thought I'd open up by throwing a few things up here. A couple other things. How many of you have made any decision based on the way that you feel? Anyone made a decision based on the way that you feel? Wow, just about everyone, huh? Okay, well, let us see. Part two to that is when we think about it from that perspective, correct 100% of the time, when you made a decision based on how you feel. What happened to all those hands? <laughs> okay. Well, if you took it a little bit further, I would ask that third part, if there was a way to raise your percentages, in other words, if you could be better at being correct, making decisions based on how you feel, would you be interested in improving that skill or ability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about with emotional intelligence. Again, we look at, if we make decisions a lot of times based on how we feel, we're not always 100% correct, but if we could improve that skill or ability, we probably would. So when we go back and looking at how we were looking at those faces and things like that, it gave us some information. Being emotionally intelligent means that we can look at those faces and make better decisions and come closer perhaps to what they were telling us. So. A lot of people feel emotions, why do they have emotions to start with? Because it's how we learn, or it's a way of adapting to those things around us to help us operate more effectively in the environment that we're in. Now this is in red, you may not be able to see it as well. This says, for example, if you're walking down a dark street late at night, you become frightened 
how does this affect your behavior? Well, typically, if we're walking down the street late at night in a dark place, we generally will have some concern about our safety. That's just normal, that's just natural. And because of that, our senses heighten. Our sense of hearing perks up a little bit. You know? You hear everything. Yeah, you hear everything. You know? Your vision becomes better. Sometimes it gets out of control. You see imaginary things in the dark. But the fact of the matter is, our emotions kick in and they tell us we need to be more aware of our environment or our surroundings. So our hearing, our smelling, all of those things, you know, kind of kick up a little bit until we get into a what we would consider a more safe environment. And when we do, then we relax a little bit, you know, the sense of smell kind of goes down a little bit, the hearing goes down a little bit because our senses don't have to be so concerned. Well, emotions really do drive just about everything that we do. For instance, I know most of you have friends and associates, people that you kind of hang out with. Why do you hang out with them? What was that? They make you feel good. They make you feel good? Common interest. Common interest. Most of the time, it's because what? We like them. We like them. There's some things about them that, that we're drawn to, whether it's the ethnicity or gender or whatever. You know, some common things. Even if the things aren't common, if we like them, we like them. That's an emotional attachment. That's, for instance, you know, if the friend or if we move away, we miss them, don't we? Yeah, it's like losing a part of us. We have an emotional attachment to, to them. We don't know why, we just do, okay? Even when we're in a relationship with someone, whether you know, it's our girlfriend, boyfriend, significant other, whatever that relationship is, it's an emotional attachment. Sometimes when I'm doing this uh, workshop with uh, those that have uh, gotten married and raised kids and things like that, I ask them when they were thinking about entering into a relationship with someone, did they have any specific criteria? And most of the time, they do. And most of the time, we do. For instance, we say things like, well, the woman that I marry will be, you know, 5'7", you know, she'll have me, you know, uh, uh, talk about her, yeah. her figure and all, and, you know, that uh, she'll have a maybe a master's degree in this and that. We have all kinds of criteria that we set. Okay. Same thing with women, you know. They say the man that I'll marry will be tall, dark, and handsome, and he'll have this, he'll have a good job, and he'll be driving a Mercedes or whatever, and all of those things. But then I ask the third part to that question, I ask them, the person that they're currently with did they meet those criteria? <laughs> and the answer generally is no. No, they didn't. Or no, they don't. So the question becomes, then why did we select that person? Why are we with that person? Why do you think that, what do you think the big answer is? Because we like them. We like them. We love them. That was an emotional decision. That criteria, all of that stuff went out the window. It's funny, isn't it? How emotions drive just about everything that we do. Well, as we get older, we move, we're moving out into looking at jobs and getting jobs and things like that. Nowadays, a lot of companies are saying, you know, when we interview people, we use not only behavioral interviewing, but they use what is called emotional interviewing, interviewing with emotional intelligence. In other words, the kinds of questions and the kinds of uh, responses that they are expected to hear and see tie very well into emotional intelligence. And so you're going to hear a lot of that start to come out in the days ahead, years ahead, when we're talking about emotional intelligence, how important that is. 
that when you sit for an interview and you have a very good interviewer, he or she is probably skilled in the area around emotional intelligence and they will ask questions that will provoke a response from you that will allow them to have an idea about your emotional intelligence. Okay? Even when we're out making big decisions like buying cars and houses and things like that, usually they're emotional decisions. You know, we go out and say, well, you know, I'm gonna go out and buy this car, it has to get, uh, you know, 35 miles to a gallon, you know, it has to, you know, have all of these luxury things and all that luxury thing. You walk into the dealership, one of the first things the dealer asks you is, how's it going, how can it help you, what are you looking for, things like that. And then they get around to asking you to take a test drive, a test drive in the vehicle. You know why they want you to test? drive the vehicle? Yeah, to make sure that you want it. They want, they want you to get, have an emotional and emotional connection to the vehicle. Because if it doesn't feel right, you're not going to get it, right? So what happened to all that 35 miles to a gallon and all those other things that you were thinking about? Yeah. It's gone out the window too because when you get back, they ask you, when you sat in it, Dr. Timmons, how did it feel? Wow, it felt good. How did it feel when you turned the corner and making the, did it take the potholes with ease? In other words, they want to know what was the feeling. Because that's emotion. Those are emotional decisions. That's emotional information, emotional data. So when we think about emotional intelligence, it's about being intelligent about emotions. How do we use that information? So, with that, let me tell you a little bit about me and some of the other things that uh, you heard earlier. There's an organization that exists now. It's called the Society of Emotional Intelligence. Until 2009, that organization did not exist. Okay? The organization Society of Emotional Intelligence is about and for people who are interested in becoming more aware of emotional intelligence, developing their emotional intelligence, and it's sort of like a fan club or a hangout, if you will, for people who want to interact with other people around the concept of emotional intelligence. Well, I founded that organization because it was one of those things that was missing. Okay? So some of the other things that I do is, you know, I do consulting work and I do coaching around emotional intelligence. And when I use the term coaching, Think, if you will, like a professional baseball player, professional football player. They all have coaches. Even though they know how to play football, they've been playing football for years and what have you. You know, singers, actors, they all have professional coaches. The purpose of the coach is to do what? Train. Train. Like sort of, to tune you up. Yeah, to tune you up. Fine tune whatever those skills or abilities are that you have. Because we were talking about somebody like a professional basketball player, they've been playing basketball for, you know, too. Ever since they were little kids and all through college and into the pros. So why do they need a coach? Because they want to keep their skills sharp. So part of my role in working with individuals and companies and organizations is people who are interested in developing their emotional intelligence about helping keep their skills sharp. Also, one of the other things is there are instruments, and I'll give you a, a sort of a test we're going to do a little bit later on uh, assessing a person's emotional intelligence. So one of the things that I do is help certify people on how to do that. And then uh, there's a, I have a radio show. It's an internet radio talk show. And so they call me Dr. Hank. The internet radio show is called Let's Talk EI, or Let's Talk About Emotional Intelligence. And it airs weekly. The, um, it's moving from a monthly show to a weekly show. So the first weekly show will be April 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, if you want to listen to the show, you just 
go to Let's Talk PI at Gmail and I'll send you the link uh, to it. You want to call in and talk to where the guests are and things like that. It's 1-877-230-3062. But I'll share more of that a little bit later. But the idea is just like um, any radio show, it's designed for people who are interested in talking about a subject or topic. They call in and talk about it. Questions, answers, share information with different guests. One of the other things that uh, I've taken a couple of stabs at is writing books. Uh, the last one that I did was Put Your Emotional Intelligence Be Over Your Back. Okay. So that's a little bit of my background. Now let's jump right into having a, a working definition. Because whenever you use a term, we always kind of like to you know, define it up and say what it really means. So, what is emotional intelligence? Having the skill and ability to recognize, understand, and use emotions to successfully manage our day-to-day -day interactions with ourselves and others. Remember, with ourselves, do we ever have to manage our emotions that we have with ourselves? Yes. Yeah. Because I heard, I was sitting in the back room, but I heard there were a couple of people up here that get angry pretty quickly. Did you, did you, did you hear that? Yeah. So if that is the case, then they have to do what? A little self-talk, right? Because if they know that, and that's called awareness, they know that, they can't allow that to happen as much as it used to happen. You see, once you know that, if you say, geez, I get angry really quickly, well, you won't be able to say, you know, I used to get angry really quickly. Because... The self-awareness told you that you do. And what you have to do is to find a solution to that. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about things that you can do and practice to and deal with that. So self-awareness is like one of those keys. It is right at the very, very top. Another way to think about emotional intelligence is being intelligent about our emotions the intelligent use of our emotion. In other words, having our emotions work for us rather than against us. Question, how can your emotion work against you? How can your emotion work against you? Give me an example. Say that in the workforce or whatnot, you're the boss. Okay. And one of your I guess employees are getting your data. Okay. And you are getting complaints in the workforce that your partner, but it's also your um one of your employees is starting to not is starting to lack. Okay. So it comes to the point of you being a boss and having to let this person go. Okay. But then again, be in a relationship Ooh. and let them down slowly. <laughs> That's going to be tough, isn't it? Yeah, because you don't want to break up with this person, but you mess with my money. So. Wow. <laughs> that is a tough one. Now, in reality, that does happen. It happens all the time in, in work environments. And that's one of the things that they say in work environments is you're not supposed to what? Date your employees. You're not supposed to date your employees. You're not supposed to have a relationship with people that you work with. with because it causes issues. When you have to make a decision, it, it's tough because can I favor the person that I have a relationship with or, my or do I favor my money? Uh, you know, and most of the time, well, okay, i put it this way. When you favor the person that you have a relationship too many times, you lose your money. And so you soon learn I have to stay with people money and not the person yeah, yeah. that I have a relationship with. So that's why you try to tell the person that you have a relationship with early, you can't have a relationship in this environment. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a tough one, but your emotions can work against you if you're not able to manage or control those things. And I know it sounds easy to say, but it's not easy to do a lot of times. Just kind of tell you about what we call our brain without emotional intelligence. We all have brains. We 
fed like we were little babies, little kids. We grew up with emotional intelligence. You know, our brain, when we're confronted with an issue, and we'll say, we'll call it a bear in the woods. When we're confronted with a bear in the woods, we generally have three major choices. One choice is to do what? Fight. Fight, Fight that bear. What's the likelihood of being successful? <laughs> Not a bear. Not a bear. Yeah, fairly zero. Another option that we have is to play freeze, dead. play dead. Yeah, we've heard, you know, well, just play dead. How many of us would play dead? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few that might play dead, but most people go, you know, I'd rather try to do what? Run. But get away from the bear. Because, you know, the bear may not go for this playing dead thing, and I'm just right here. So, you know, but those those are general choices. Okay. Now, in the work environment, if we take this same scenario and you move into a work environment, there may be something that happens in the work environment. Don't know what it is, but let's just go with this situation that we just heard earlier. A relationship exists in the work environment. I have to decide whether to keep this person or let them go. You know, one, you know, to fight means that I'm going to try and resolve the issue. Okay? Or I could do what? Ignore it. Just, just try to ignore it. If I ignore it long enough, it'll go away long enough. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an option. Or what I can do, I can make that hard decision. Somebody's got to go the relationship of the money and I don't want to lose the money. Okay. That's not the money. No, I don't want to lose the money. That's our brain without emotional intelligence. You want to say our brain with emotional intelligence? Yeah. Our brain with emotional intelligence, we still have the same three choices. However, we can have some additional choices so what might be some additional choices that might exist with that relationship? Giving advice. Negotiation. Well, that's a good one. What are we going to negotiate? Because that's is a choice. I like that one. Yeah. Well, we're here today. How are we going to proceed? Yeah. What's going to be our pathway that's going to get us to get stuck? Yeah. What was that one? Definitive next step. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So rather than just the three options, we, we can try and figure out some other options. We just kind of heard two of them just like that. Okay. So our brain with emotional intelligence gives us more choices of how to deal with emotional situations. So back here, when we had those emotional situations, we were fairly limited because we weren't thinking, quote, outside of the box. But when we started to use our emotional intelligence, if you will, we started finding other options, other ways to deal with it. So again, in the work environment, that's why corporations are saying, you know, we want people who use their emotional intelligence you're saying that we want people who can look at a lot of different options and deal with things, deal with issues, rather than just kind of being locked into maybe what it was a little bit of deal with it. So, when, I, when you hear the term emotion or emotional intelligence, sometimes people talk about negative emotions and positive emotions. I don't see emotion as negative or positive, but for the sake of discussion, in terms of just kind of talking about them, we can call some of these emotions as negative in terms of having an adverse <laughs> impact on us. For instance, most of us say that stress is not a good thing to have. Oh, no. Okay? While stress can be okay, too much stress can have an adverse impact on us, right? So that when we have moderate levels of stress, that's okay. I mean, we can deal with those. Okay. But when we have too much stress, what happens? What can be some of the downsides? Burnout. Burnout, what Health else? Problems. Health problems. Health problems, absolutely. What else? 
physical problems, yeah. And so stress is something that we then need to be able to do something about. Now let's say that we, I was under a lot of stress at work. How might my behavior be if I'm at work and I'm under a lot of stress? Okay. Short. Short? Unproductive. Unproductive? Say it louder. Anxious? Okay. Yeah. So if you are my employee, you're people that work for me, and I'm really anxious, I'm really short, how does that impact you? You feel it. Like I can't come to talk to you about it. Can't come and talk to me because I'm gonna do what? Snap. Snap, cut you off. So what's gonna to happen to performance in our productivity? Everybody, Everybody starts to fall short, yeah. Yeah. So then that's an emotion, stress, an emotion that's kinda of out of control that I need to be able to get under control so I can manage so that it won't impact what we're doing here at work. And the same thing can apply to a lot of the other ones. I just throw some up here for just for us to look at because sometimes people don't think about these as being emotions. There are tons of emotions out there. We need to understand how they impact us and how we can manage them. On the other side of the coin, there are some positive emotions out there. In the workplace, the workplace says, yeah, we need more enthusiastic workers. You know, we need laughter in the workplace. We need people who can show empathy. And believe me, empathy is a big one you know, in the workplace. Understanding how the people feel about things. Gratitude and appreciation, optimism, all these things are positive or can be perceived as positive emotions. But if you take the positive and negative sides away, all it means is that we still need to be able to recognize these different kinds of emotions, understand what they are, be able to manage and respond to them appropriately. That's the key, responding appropriately. So, how do we respond appropriately when we encounter someone who's resentful? Well, we can just be resentful ourselves. That's probably not gonna solve it and make the work. Okay? So we need to be able to empathize with the person who's resentful, maybe even help understand why they may be resentful, and maybe help them work through that resentfulness. Now, the key is, and there are a lot of different models, just like, you know, you, you and I was talking about cars earlier, there are Fords, there are Chevys, there are Buicks, there are Mercedes, there are BMWs, there's Chrysler 300s. There are all kinds of vehicles, all kinds of cars. They all kind of do one thing though. They get us to where we're going. They're a vehicle, okay? Emotional intelligence have different models. So if you Google the term emotional intelligence, you're going to see emotional intelligence show up in different models. But they are all talking about one key thing, and that is being able to understand how to manage and respond to emotional data or emotional information. So this is just one model. And I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know that you can find other models. But this is one of these four-part models that says there's something called self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. In other words, it's just kind of two sides. I need to be able to be aware of and manage stuff that goes on with me, and I need to be aware of and manage stuff that goes on with others or come from others that impacts me. Or I need to be aware of how my emotions impact these folks over here. So, just sort of like two sides with the emotional intelligence sitting in the corner. So, let's kind of define just, just briefly. When we talk about self-awareness, we talk about being able to recognize your own emotions. Being able to recognize your own emotions and 
knowing your strengths and uh, as Dr. Thomas had some of the challenges that uh, you might run into, he could refer to some of the things as strengths and struggles, okay? So knowing what some of your strengths and struggles are would be another way of thinking about that. And being able to know what you know your confidence level is around the things that you do. Self-management, on the other hand, would be able to manage some of the things that go on with you, uh, control impulsive feelings and behaviors that you have. Sometimes, has anyone in here bought anything on the internet? Oh yeah. Often that's an impulsive feeling. That's an impulsive vibe. We see something on the internet and we just can't help it. We just have to buy it. Okay. So when you run into something like that, one of the things we talk about is impulse control. How do we manage that so that we can see things on the internet, you know, and don't buy it, you know, or don't order it? Classic example, uh, there's this uh, one store on the internet called Shop NBC. I think, yeah, Shop NBC, I think it is. My wife, she was notorious for shopping in NBC on the internet. She would have FedEx and UPS making deliveries just about every day until we went to work on that. When we went to work on that, at first, it was go ahead, order whatever you want, and it's just like you've been doing. Okay? However, when UPS delivers them, don't bring the packages in the house. Just leave them outside. Okay? So after about a week, with all these boxes stacked up outside, she began to realize what she was doing in terms of the purchases she was making. And of course, she wound up sending them back. That was the idea, is that you don't bring them in the house, you leave them out there, and then after a while, you send them back. And so slowly, with that as just one approach for dealing with the impulse to buy, she began to order less and less. And so there were fewer and fewer boxes stacked up outside. Now we don't have that issue at all. Maybe there's once a month there is a UPS or FedEx delivery from shop in NBC online. Is it one really big box? No, no, no. Kind <laughs> 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 of saved it all up. <laughs> well, there was a lot, of, a lot of, I mean, all kinds of little boxes, some with envelopes and stuff like that. But the thing was, you know, people were impulsive buyers. Just like when you're in the market and you know, you're buying groceries, or you saw your parents buying groceries, they have these, uh, just before you get to the checkout counter on your right and left side, they have this roll of stuff, right? What do they call that stuff? Impulse. Impulse items. Impulse items. Because nobody needed those things until they got there. And then that's when you discover all of this candy that you needed and all of the Inquirer magazines and all this other stuff. They put it there for impulse purpose only. Because they could they have they have a candy aisle, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they put the one right there at the checkout counter. Just in case. Just in case. And just in case you brought the kids with you. <laughs> the kids can also encourage their close by. It's an emotional thing. You know, that anyway, you get the idea. So think about it for a minute. You know, what might be, and you can just in the pairs that you're in, what might be a situation or an example of self-awareness to you. Is there anything that have happened recently that raised your self-awareness that caused you to say, oh, I'm aware of this behavior, I am aware of my weakness in this. I mean, if, does anything come to mind? And also, just think for a moment in terms of self-management, what is one thing that you now control or able to manage better than you used to? 
What is one thing, a behavior or an emotion that you're able to manage now better than you used to? Just kind of think of it on the court now. We'll just kind of talk to each other just for a couple of seconds. Self-moving. Self-moving. Okay, I know you're right in the midst of talking about them, but uh, does anyone have one that uh, they can share real quick? Yes. I think uh, for me, the self-awareness was anger. Um, I feel like I learned that when you let people anger you, you let them control you, and I don't want anyone controlling my emotions or my actions in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just learned to not ever get upset. Okay. You know, not ever, not ever get angry. Okay. And you learn how to manage those things that might cause you to get angry. In other words, when it's coming at you or coming to you, you go, oh yeah, this is going to make me angry, so I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, so that I can get angry. you just accept it, you know, either you deflect and put a wall up and don't absorb it, or you deflect it. Um, there's a lot of, for me, there's a lot of different ways I okay. deal with negative emotions coming towards me, because Emotions will mess you up, man. You'll make some bad decisions. You'll, um, you know, you'll be off your game, and I, I've got to be on point. Yes. Often. Often. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, a strength is um, I, I like to say that I smile to control emotion. It's like working with people all the time. It helps open doors and break down barriers and makes the situation more smooth. And just I express mm -hmm. myself and smile to you know, positive outlook. Absolutely. One of the things that they used to tell me many, many years ago is that I didn't smile enough, you know, uh, because people want to generally embrace, but if they don't see a smile or see what appears like a friendly face, most of the time they, they, they'll want to keep their distance, especially with African Americans or people that appear to be African American. It is because there's this reputation that went out there in front of us. I don't know where it came from, but it always said that we were angry. So, who wants to deal with angry people? No one. So you have to let people know that you're not angry. And so that was one of the things we said, you know, you gotta have a more pleasant look on your face or smile more often. Or they used to ask me things like, what are you angry about all the time? They would ask me, what am I angry about all the time? I go, well, I'm not angry. They say, well, you look like it. You need to be able to manage relationships. Relationships are important because, again, in the workplace or in school, we have a relationship with each other. You know? And we need each other. And in today's work environment, they encourage people to work together in a team type of an environment. So being able to go into that environment and be a part of a team is a really important uh, piece. Social awareness, we need to have what we call social responsibility. Social responsibility is not necessarily about helping out in the community, although that is very important. Social responsibility can be you know, helping a teammate, helping a co-worker in whatever it is that they're doing. You often hear people say things like, that's not my job, okay? That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing to say or demonstrate in the work environment. What they want are people who say, well, 
I'm done with my portion of whatever it is that I'm supposed to be working with, but I see Mike might need some help over there. Let me go over and check and see if I can help Mike out or give Mike a hand. So they want people who are looking to demonstrate social responsibility. So that leads us to this. Why should I develop my emotional intelligence? Well, we've been kind of talking about it quite a bit, but the reason is, well, there's a long, long list, and this is based on a lot of research out there, from everything from academic performance, it has been shown that if people, students develop their emotional intelligence, they have a better relationship with the faculty or the teachers, they have a better relationship with their classmates, so therefore it impacts their grades. It impacts their grades. And then when you're moving on down to talking about the workplace, People in customer service and sales, we know how important all of that is. Uh, I mentioned how important it is in the workforce and the recruitment and retention, hiring and interviewing, all of that. And last but not least, it's going to impact, cause you to have a healthier and happier life. But if you don't work on your emotional intelligence for no other reason other than towards having a healthier and happier life, that's reason enough. That's reason enough. Because if we can reduce stress, if we can reduce the impact of negative emotions on us, it's going to lead us towards having that healthier and happier life. So, how do you develop your DI? How do you develop your emotional intelligence? Just one of the things that sometimes people will struggle with. I say, first, you need to know where you are. For instance, if you're in today's vehicles, they have GPS systems in them, right? Most of them. And so you say, well, I'm going to drive from here to um, Atlanta. Well, yeah, you can just get on 75 and go. But you might uh, say, but I don't want to just, you know, take the interstate. I want to take, you know, some bypasses and stuff like that. So when you program into the GS at GPS system that you want to go from Tampa to Atlanta, one of the first things that it needs to know is what? Where you are right now. Where you are right now. Because it has to get in touch with the satellite. And the satellite says, I need to know where he is right now so that I can plot a course for him to get to where he wants to get to. So <coughs> About your EI, you need to know where you are right now. That's one of the first steps. The second step is to identify those areas of strengths and challenges, okay? What do I do well and what don't I do as well? What could I do better, perhaps? And then you need to create and develop a plan. I call it the EIDP, or the Emotional Intelligence Development Plan. And don't be discouraged because I said 90 days but realistically, it takes at least 90 days for you to see any real change in behavior or any real change in the way that you are now and the way that you want to be. It's going to take about 90 days. That's to see change. Okay. And the last thing I have here, this is my selfish promotion. I said, you know, if you're part of the organization, not to society, but most of the intelligence, but that's another thing. Okay. So let's take a quick look at what your emotional intelligence might be now, okay? And so what we're going to do, this is a, an example. We'll make sure that we see that this is an example, okay? And so this is just a snapshot. What I'm going to put up is a series of questions and or statements. All you need to do is read the statements and then give yourself a score. And the score is based on this five-point liquor kind of scale. For instance, number one says, in all circumstances, I respect other people and their feeling. So you would give yourself a score for number one, an honest score. So if you always do that, then you would give yourself a five. If you never, almost never do that, you give yourself a one. And if you're somewhere in between, well, you find a number that best represents where you are, okay? And so for each statement, you read the statement and give an honest, because the only person that's going to see this is you, 
Okay? So you read the statement and give yourself an honest score of where you feel you fit as it relates to that. Yes? When you say I take responsibility for my emotions, give me an example. Well, just like we heard the young lady saying over here that people make her angry, and so she learned how to not let that happen. She took responsibility for her emotions. These people are no longer in charge of my emotions. I'm in charge of my emotions. So that would be an example of that one. What an example. Because there are a lot of instruments out there that will give you uh, an overview of how your emotional intelligence is, where you currently stand. And it's designed to identify with those areas of self-awareness, self-management, relationship uh, management, and all of that. So that's what these questions or statements are based on. How well do you do those four key areas? So let's say, for instance, if you have between 40 and 45, if you will, that means that you have a high level of emotional maturity, awareness, and control. You have a positive and inspiring impact on others. I mean, you're pretty good in terms of being able to manage and deal with the, your emotions currently. Between 35 and 39, higher than average level of emotional intelligence, although you should concentrate on self-awareness and control and developing increased empathy for others. And then it kind of moves on down, and probably no one fell in the 9 to 26, but even if you did fall in the 9 to 26, I would put you in the same category as the 40 to 45, and that is it doesn't matter where you are, there's always room for what? Mm -hmm. Improvement. Absolutely. You know, so regardless of where your emotional intelligence currently is, this was designed to give you an opportunity to say, oh, I understand how they look at this right here. So, was anyone between 40 and 45? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, between 35 and 39. Now, when, yeah, okay. So, those are kind of where I would see most people just in general because most of the time we don't almost never do anything. We don't almost always do anything. So, we probably fall within uh, uh, one of the ranges. So, that concludes a lot of what I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to throw it over because we have a few more minutes. Some questions and answers, questions that you might have, maybe answers I don't have, but I'm going to back and direct you to where the answers can come from. So, questions? Yes, sir? Where's your book can be purchased? Through Book Locker or Amazon.com. Which one gives you more money? Or takes out less charge. We'll, we'll get it from there. Book Locker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Book Locker was my publisher. You know, publisher. Yeah. And they're located here for. Other questions? Yes. I guess um, for these guys, what are the top attributes emotionally that employers are looking for in? Their age group, you know, are they looking for, you know, someone that can make people feel comfortable if it's a multinational corporation? Are they looking for, you know, someone, what, I guess, attribute, can these guys kind of go home and work on that would make them more valuable uh, when applying for jobs? Well, the biggest one is self-awareness. And self-awareness is not only self-awareness about you, but self-awareness about others. In other words, you know, you are aware of how other people uh, behaviors and things may impact you. So that, you know, if the question is, um, you have a coworker that is upset, how might that impact you? Uh, being able to acknowledge the fact that that person is upset would be an important thing to be able to do. And some people say, well, that's his problem, not mine. In the work environment, that's not true. You know, that's our issue. You know, and as a coworker, I may need to find out. You know, is there anything that I can do to 
maybe help that person. Yeah. Empathy would be another one of those. Empathy is more about understanding the other person's point of view, realizing the fact that your point of view is not the only one out there. It's important to see the other person's perspective. Even though you may not agree with it, or you may not adopt it, you may not make it yours, you need to acknowledge the fact that it exists. And they are entitled to it. Yeah, go ahead and give it 